Hello and welcome. I'm Jennifer Oz Freeman. I'm uh, the Associate Professor and Program Director for Theology and the Arts at United, and we're really excited to have with us today Minnesota State Representative Lee Finke, um, who will be talking to us about her work in the legislature and um, particularly her uh, work around uh, protecting and um, lifting up the lives of trans and non-binary youth in our state of Minnesota. Um, so just a word about Lee. Um, she's the first trans woman elected to the leg legislature in Minnesota. She represents District 66A in St. Paul, where she's a longtime resident. She is the vice chair of the Legacy Finance Committee and serves on the Environment and Natural Resources Finance and Policy, Human Services Policy, and Judiciary uh, Finance and Civil Law Committees. A lot of committees. <laughs> uh, she's also the chair of the Queer Caucus, which will she be, uh, she'll be speaking about here, which was formed uh, just last year in 2023. She is committed to advocating for LGBTQ equality, climate justice, and the rights of incarcerated community members. So um, we will make some comments about her work, share with us her recent work, and uh, then we'll have some time for questions and conversation. So please join me in welcoming Lee. There we go. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, thank you to um, Dr. Oz Freeman for that introduction. Jennifer is a very old, dear friend, and I'm so grateful to, to be sharing these spaces with all of you and with her uh, 20 plus years later. Um, as you heard, my name is Lee Finke. I'm going to try not to look at that. I mean, there are people over here, but when I look at you, it just doesn't look like I'm doing that. So I'll look this way. I'm Lee Finke. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I represent 66A in the Minnesota House of Representatives, which includes this space that we are currently standing. So welcome to my district. Uh, we, are, we are in St. Paul. Sometimes people don't realize that. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, just generally speaking, the, the landscape of trans uh, politics. Uh, LGBTQ politics at large, my my work last year, my work this year, and I think where we're going. And to do that, we have to talk about the national landscape and we have to talk about very local situation of our community. So it's always together when we're doing this work, um, but that's just a little bit about where it will go. So um, as you heard, I was elected in 2022. I started serving in 2023 as the first out trans person elected in the Minnesota legislature. Um, we also started the Queer Caucus. We elected 11 LGBTQ people in 2022. Um, before that, yeah, it was incredible. 2022 was the rainbow wave nationally. If you um, follow such things, there was a huge number, a huge increase. We are all the way up to 0.2% um, of elected people in the United States represent uh, identifying as LGBTQ. So we actually have very, very little representation, but we're getting up into the 0 0.3 range, hopefully this time. Uh, so I was, I was elected, we started the Queer Caucus, we got the trifecta, we worked on trans rights. Um, the short version of what, what happened last year. Um, we passed the trans refuge bill because we saw what was happening in the national landscape. Uh, fi over 500 anti-LGBTQ bills were introduced uh, across the nation last year. More than 100 of them became law. Um, entire regions of the country became essentially hostile anti-trans zones, um, places where it was no longer safe to try to access healthcare for your child, uh, for minors or vulnerable adults, um, but also for many, many adults as well. Um, there was no doubt that the plan is not to just take away rights from minors, but to take away rights of all queer and, and trans people. Um, and I do mean trans, non-binary, and two-spirit when I say trans. Sometimes I'll use all three. Sometimes I'll just say trans. Um, but I'm using that in the broad sense. Um, so we passed the trans refuge bill. It was a great success. It was a remarkable moment for the community. We had the support of the governor. We had 
up and down the DFL party was, was behind us. And that was essential in our ability to get that done um, and to get it done relatively quickly. We, we had that signed into law May 2nd or something like that. Like by the end of April, we were done and it was a big victory. Um, and it was a one-time victory. And it was, it was a statement of a promise that we would protect trans people uh, if they needed to get gender affirming care, they could, if they lived here, if they came here, if they moved here, we would protect you. Um, and the important thing about trans refuge is that it is not a one and done kind of vote. You can't protect someone one time and then say you're done, right? It is a promise. It is saying, we will do this. We will look out for you when, when you get here and as long as you are here. Uh, so when we started that process, it was with the expectation that people might come to Minnesota uh, from nearby states. Um, when we introduced the bill, 11 states had started, or seven had actually passed laws that um, restricted gender affirming care. 11, an additional four were in the process of it at the time. And then when we finished that bill, I think it was like 17 states. So the need became, the need just continued to become self-evident as we move forward. By the time we got to today, it's like 27 states or something like that. I'm not sure. Um, it's a really dystopian situation for our community. And it has been for a long time. This is a lot of background just to say, um, when, when I arrived and the Queer Caucus arrived at the Minnesota Capitol, Things were so rapidly declining for the trans community that it's almost impossible to overstate the importance of what Minnesota did last year, um, especially in the upper Midwest. Uh, if you look to the west of us, the next state that's actually investing in protecting trans people is Washington. If you go south of here, there's nowhere. Mexico City. Uh, if, you know, there's there's Colorado, there's Illinois, but there's this huge swaths of the West and Midwest uh, and Plains where people are living in essentially like apocalyptic islands of anti-transness. Of course, there are blue spaces in those states, right? There is cities where people live and people, not everybody can just up, uproot their lives and move to Minnesota, nor should they be expected to do so. Um, but for those who can, we need to be protecting them. So the that's kind of like, we also banned conversion therapy. We did these other pieces of the legislative, we used our legislative action to do what we could. It's getting more legit policy heavy than I wanted to be. I wanted to come in here and I wanted to talk about next and I wanted to talk about where we are, but I think it's so important for us to understand the trajectory um, because in 2024, we've seen an equal number of bills introducing at the same pace, but they're dramatically worse. They're going after adult health care. They're, they're taking away the rights of parents. There's bills to criminalize teachers who support trans kids. There are bills to put adults who affirm their trans kids on the sex offender registries in their states. The, 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 the cruelty of what we're seeing this year compared to last year is significantly increased. And what that tells you is that even though Minnesota has been doing a tremendous job being proactive and recognizing the needs of our community, um, the other side thinks that they are winning. And they think that, I mean, they're probably right. They are, they are moving in a way that shows that this is paying off for them and they are going to continue to amplify and increase their attacks on our community because it is paying dividends for them. Otherwise, they just wouldn't do it. If it was bad politics, they would stop. If it wasn't working, they would stop. And they're not. They're getting more vicious in more places. And we're going to continue to have to do this work into the future. Um, that's a very difficult thing to say. And I know it's a difficult thing for many people to hear. Um, but we have to just be realistic about what the landscape is. Um, what we're seeing now is a real move to school spaces. Um, all the states that can and will ban gender affirming care pretty much have, but now they're moving into schools, uh, making sure that they are doing everything they can to vil vilify, alienate, and create a violent environment for children who are uh, trans, non-binary, and two-spirit, and gay, and lesbian, and bisexual. There's no, there's no limit on this, right? We're just the du jour 
community to hate. It's not about our transness. It's just the political value that comes with attacking it. Um, and that's a really important thing to remember as well. There's nothing actually unique about this moment in trans um, political targeting. Uh, it's happened to pretty much every other community at some point in history. It's the least unique thing about us that there is a national craze targeting our civil rights. Uh, it's so it's so standard American playbook. It's just our time. Um, and we need to survive it, and then we need to see who will come next, and we need to protect them too. So that's just an aside, but it's an important one to me. Um, when when we look at what's happening in the school space right now, we are the mo I mean, uh, obviously we were all we all. I shouldn't say that, right? Obviously, because nobody knows what nobody knows. Uh, this is a university, so I'm in my epistemology mode. Um, but, you know, um, a 16-year-old trans kid was killed in Oklahoma, if you didn't hear this. Um, his name was Nex Benedict. Uh, he was assaulted in the bathroom at school by three older students, um, all girls. Um, he was a trans non-binary, used he, him, and they, them pronouns. He was using the bathroom. Three of the people who bullied him over the past year um, were in the bathroom harassing him, and he threw some water on them, uh, and they assaulted him. And then the next day, he died in the hospital. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of like the typification of every adult and young trans person's nightmare that you will enter the bathroom, and that will be it. Right, you never know what's going to be behind the door when you go into the bathroom, uh, and the, what the situation that we are putting our students in, especially in states like Oklahoma, um, it's so dangerous. As, I mean, it's malfeasance, it's misfeasance, it's it's criminal. It should be criminal for us to allow what is happening in states like o Oklahoma to happen, um, but it, unfortunately, it's it's very very common, and it is something that. All of us fear. Uh, it doesn't matter what state you live in. There's no promise of safety because you're in Minnesota. You can't promise who's going to be in the bathroom when you go to the bathroom. So the the situation is really sorry. It's really bad. It's really bad. And and in Minnesota, we're trying really hard to make it better. And in Minnesota, we are trying to not just protect people, but indicate to the national trans community that people are fighting and winning, even on a local level. I, I, there are so few places where we have people asking for, like I had a bill hearing this week on a bill that would just help people who are coming to Minnesota because of the trans refuge bill find jobs. Because if you're moving your whole family, things are really bad. And you, you need a little help. You need support. You need a soft landing. You need to find schools. You need to find jobs. Um, every time I go out in any public space or event, I meet people who have moved here. Uh, if you talk to any trans person, we are constantly meeting people who have relocated to Minnesota because of what we have done. And it's very encouraging to me. And it makes me very emotional to think about um, this just happened last night. I talked to a couple and the joy and relief that they feel being here is something that I'm very proud of. And it's also sort of a feedback loop of the nightmare situation that our communities live in, right? I, I don't want people to have to feel the relief of being free to walk down the street, which is what I hear. Like, I can't believe I can just talked about being trans. I was at the store and I saw two trans people, you know, and it's like, I've never done that before. I've never seen that before. And the simple, the simplicity of freedom that has been taken from people is really hard for us to imagine here, especially in Minneapolis, St. Paul, where um, we do have a visible and out you know, uh, population of queer people um, and trans people. There are just trans people here and there are more and more all the time, which I think is so great. Um, but I wish that didn't have to be the case. So 
what we're doing this year, we're really trying hard to follow through on some of the promises that we made, right? If you promise trans refuge, then we need to increase the number of people who are offering gender affirming care because we already had a shortage and now more people are coming. So we have some money, hopefully we can pass to help entice people to move from those states who also practice gender affirming care. If you live in Missouri and all your clients can no longer access care, well, if they're leaving, you might also be interested in coming with your clients, right? And going to a place where you can serve without prosecution. Um, we we want to do internship programs and, and fellowship programs to, to with Children's Minnesota and other places where people can learn gender affirming care and become more. We need to increase the number of providers, um, but we also need to increase safety in our schools. I have a bill for a model policy. Um, Minnesota Department of Education to create a model policy on gender inclusion policies for schools. Uh, feel free to write your uh, action item. I'm trying to get that in a hearing. That's one of the most important things I think that we can do, um, but it's controversial, right? And it isn't controversial. It's only controversial if I am a controversial, ex my existence is controversial and I refuse to accept that. Um, so, you know, write your, representatives and senators. But I think these are the spaces where we need to remind everyone what we're doing and what the stakes are. We need to remind everyone what it means to say we will be a refuge. And if you come for safety, that means we have to provide that safety. And that's something that I worry about. I will be honest, I worry that we're gonna say, okay, we're a trans refuge now. Like, congratulations, everyone. Like Minnesota, pat ourselves on the back. Um, we're very good at that in Minnesota not following through on making our communities safer and better, right? We love our statistics about being first in the nation, um, but it's never for everyone. We all know the disparities that we have in Minnesota and we can't introduce an entire community to our state and then let them fall into that disparity position again. So that's really what I'm trying to prioritize in my work and in the queer caucuses work. Um, it's really important for us to, to continue to use what political power we are able to gather on behalf of our community. And last year we had no, the last session we had no queer caucus. So to have a caucus, you need four, right? And we never had four prior to this year. Now we have 14 people in the queer caucus, one session later. Uh, that's remarkable. That is enough people to kill any bill if we were so inclined. And I'm getting more and more inclined to start threatening <laughs> because we need our community to be protected. We were elected, the rainbow wave wasn't elected to not protect our communities. That's not what people were hoping would happen when we got there. So I, I'm, you're getting me on a day, particularly when I'm like not ready to give up on a couple of our, our initiatives that were being told are too controversial. Um, so yeah, that's what we're, that's the only thing that you go into politics for. I never planned to be a politician, but now that I am, I'm not gonna just say, oh, I'm sorry, trans people are controversial, maybe next year. Like, I don't care about staying in politics. I care about my community, being able to serve my community in this way and being able to leverage our power. That is the whole point of this business. So I'm, I'm looking to, I'm looking to make sure that uh, people are hearing that, uh, both in the community and in the under the dome, as they say. Uh, and that is one of the things, like, I always try to tell people who, who want to be involved, who care about our issues, um, you've got to make sure that your representatives know that that is true. And it doesn't matter where you live, and it doesn't matter what state you're in, um, making sure that we understand that our community deserves to be considered, not just, we are not a community that needs to be separated out. We deserve rights. It's not controversial that there are trans people. It's controversial that we are losing our capacity to live freely and safely in the United States. We are in an, the dire situation. I've gotten to know many of the representatives in other states uh, who are trans and, and the situations that they face um, 
they're often like unspeakably cruel and vicious and terrible, and they don't see a path for the community. And that's something that Minnesota can offer. We can't give it to everyone, but we can show that there's a future, there's a policy future, there's a communal future, there is a healthcare future. And that the, the meaning of that to people, even people who cannot access it, you, you know, they're in my emails, they're in my direct messages saying, we're watching what you're doing there. And it means so much to know that you are there and that there is somewhere where we are winning and we are pushing forward and we are seeing our community thrive. And we can imagine that, right? We can imagine what that looks like because you are doing it. And to, for us not to be able to continue that work uh, because it may or may not be an election year or somebody may or may not think it's a, an important issue, it's just not acceptable. So that that's kind of my like my opening piece here. I um, want to talk to you all about what you want to hear and what questions you have. Um, but I'm really grateful that I have this opportunity to come and just share a little bit because this is like the Racket, Racket Minnesota just published an article yesterday. I would really check it out. It's, it profiles three families who moved to Minnesota because of the trans refuge bill. And it gives you a sense of how dire and life-threatening the constancy of uh, oppression is and what the relief looks like when you, when you can let that go. Um, and that's what we're doing. It's life or death for people. And it may not be a physical death for everyone, but not being able to put your shoulders down at any point in your entire day, anywhere in your life is a kind of death that we need to fight as well. So thank you. Whatever you would like to do next. Jennifer is doing something. <laughs> Adjusting the technology. Thank you so much for being here today. I wonder if you could share, as a legislature, in your wildest dreams, what do you hope religious people might do here in Minnesota to support the work that you're doing? And how might we work with people in other states to uh, address some of this wave of anti-trans legislation? Thank you so much for that question. Uh, because we are getting, here in Minnesota, where we're winning, we're getting a lot of um, the sort of religious freedoms pushback. Um, and I think it's really important, one, for our inclusive, queer supporting, affirming, and just queer Christians to be very vocal about what it means to practice a faith that is inclusive. Um, what we end up doing at the Capitol very often is we have a vision of, religion that comes and says, oh, the state is doing this thing and religious people don't want it. And like, we just know that that's false, right? We know every single religious community is diverse and has a plurality of views. And largely speaking, Christians in Minnesota are supportive of our community. You know, if we carve out these little carve outs, then it, the numbers look different, but there is no space in which progressive or how whatever phrase you prefer I say pro progressive Christians and I, I do want to say specifically Christians um kind of seed the ground right and you know Isaiah and faith in Minnesota and these other groups are working hard um but but they're not coming in on our issues they just aren't right because our issues are controversial um when, so what we really need our Minnesota faith communities that are loving and affirming to do is to show up when we have our issues on the table and say, we are not going to accept this. We do not believe that it is an infringement on the rights of religious people to give trans people rights. And, and you know, the First Amendment is the First Amendment. We, we aren't going to be able to get around it. We're not trying to. I come from ACLU. I'm, I'm a dedicated freedom freedom of speech, freedom of religion person. And we're not having that conversation, but unless someone's there, that's not me or our community in the Capitol to say that, 
this is going to fall on deaf ears, right? My friend Wa Jung Kim on the on the Capitol, um, on the St. Paul City Council yesterday um, or the other day, she she was speaking about um, Gaza, and she she said something like, um, "We will never have our liberation by appealing to the conscience of our oppressors," right? Like. I'm not going to be able to sit at the table and appeal to the people who are trying actively to dehumanize and take away my rights. I'm not going to get them because of their conscience. But what we can do is build the, the, the community of people who do support us, especially in religious communities, and make sure that they are working on the people around them and the people in the capital to make sure they understand that this is not... Because that's what they talk about. When they're talking about controversial, all they mean is... I'm going to get yelled at by this group in my community. Um, and usually they are faith-based groups. And I tell them that's fine. I get yelled at all the time by people. That's part of what our job is. It's not how we should make our decisions, but they want to know that other people are there for them as well. And that's the other thing I would say is, this is something else I'm thinking about a lot when we we having... Um, Minnesota is a very diverse, both um, racially and religiously, and uh, on immigration spaces. And there are tensions across communities about what it means to be affirming and what it means to be accepting and what it means to go to school, for example. Um, and we're seeing this in St. Louis Park. Uh, and we have to really tread lightly and carefully with the diversity of our, our Muslim neighbors. And we also need to be clear that our rights are not an infringement on anyone else's rights. And if we are having the conversation responsibly and we are having the conversation in good faith and with love, we will understand that we can coexist in a way that's not taking away the rights of others. I don't know if folks are following the St. Louis Park story, but that was the reason that's happening is because a law firm in Texas looked all over the country for a place that they could come and make trouble. And they did, and they succeeded. And now we're gonna to have to really be careful and thoughtful and loving and having these organizing conversations. And those are conversations your communities are far more equipped to have than politician communities. That's not really a community, but <laughs> thank you for the question. Thanks so much. So I wanted to come back to you mentioned initiatives that are too or that people are telling you are too controversial. So sort of two parts. The first is, what are those initiatives, and how can we, how can we help support those? Um, and then the the second part is, sort of going back to the cruelty of everything being introduced. It feels to me like that cruelty is both the point of the message, but it also just part of the point is to keep pushing us further and further away from our wildest dreams that we think those suddenly like protecting basic rights mm -hmm. becomes too controversial. And so the things that we really want become impossible. And so I'm also curious to know what do you what do you think is too right now feels too controversial to even introduce and you know, what could we dream about beyond? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a wonderful and beautiful question. So I'm gonna take the second part first um, and say that the cruelty is absolutely the point, right? The cruelty is absolutely the point. And it's even the point for states like Minnesota. And I'll give you an example from this week, right? Because I, I heard three of my, what I call my gay bills. I have gay bills and then I have bills. Uh, and we had three three hearings this week. And on one of them, we had a testifier come who, who was, the bill was about, you can't single out and ban rainbow flags uh, in government spaces, right? So if you have a school and there's a teacher who wants to put a rainbow sticker in the window or a pride flag on the wall, they get to do that. Um, if they don't want to, they don't have to. If you want to ban everything on the walls, you can. Uh, that's really sad to me, but that would that would be an option. You just can't single out the rainbow. Uh, and we had a teacher come in and talk about that. Um, how she's she's an elementary school teacher, and it was um, moving to hear from her about the importance of that. Uh, and it was a great hearing, and we moved forward. And and the thing that happened after that hearing is. 
the what the right wing media apparatus from our local stuff to the most heinous people whose names I don't like to say, but there's like that account, if you know that one account, um, they targeted that elementary school teacher. And now she is getting a tirade of hatred from people who will never meet her, who do not live in Minnesota, but they don't, they're not coming at me. They're not coming at the activists. They're coming at that first grade teacher because they want to make sure she doesn't do this again, right? They wanna make it so expensive. The cost is so high to speak out for our communities. And that is the point of the cruelty. And we, we can't give into it, but we also face a situation where we have to ask ourselves, what are we, will, what are we willing to ask of our community? Right, I don't ask trans kids to come to the Capitol. Right, I, I don't want them to have to do that. Sometimes they do, and there are a couple of um, young people who have gotten into a space where they've been kind of known now, and you know, will do that. But that's not something I would ask of our community because everything is public, everything's recorded, and the people who for whom the cruelty is the point will make sure that they are cruel. Um, so I think. And that's just how it affects us. In other states, they are they are true believers, right? The Attorney General of Texas is seeking the medical records of people who have left Texas. There are lawsuits. There are court fights happening. They are they are making good on the promises that they will prosecute you for being a trans person. Um, and there is no reason to do that once someone has left your state, except for you want to be cruel. You want to ruin that person's life. Right. There's nothing like if you live in Texas and you leave the laws of Texas, if the attorney general is going to follow you and, and subpoena your medical records, it's only because of hate. It's only because. <clears throat> of um, sorry. So I, I, you, I think that the, it's hard to overstate the like the, the usefulness of the cruelty, um, even where even in places like this where we're winning. Um, and, you know, to the bills, like we have, we have a slew of, of policies that we have introduced this year. You know, we have, um, the stuff that is quote unquote too controversial is the stuff around schools, right? I've introduced the pride flag bill and that is one I'm, I'm hoping that we can move forward. Um, excuse me, we had to hear like the, the difficulty about the politics of this is that it's up to the Senate. They own everything. They have a one seat. They have a one vote majority. So if someone doesn't want to do it, like we all have to just give in to that person, um, which I refuse to accept. That's what I was talking about earlier. Um, I'm going to start finding ways to refuse to accept that. Um, but we have the pride flag bill. You know, we have, I have the gender inclusion policy bill, um, which I'm just fighting to get even a hearing for. Um, we also have this dumb system that we have where we only are in session for three and a half months and our policy deadline is in two weeks, you know? So if you don't get a hearing, you're done. So we do it. The reason that we do it the way we do it is like, doesn't interest me. We should just do the system better. I'm working on that too. Uh, there's no reason to be in session for 14 weeks and then not be able to do anything for the rest of the year. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. That's just a personal gripe. Um, yeah, so those are the spaces, though, that I think are the most important right now. We have a couple of other bills. I know Rep Kozlowski has some stuff around LGBTQ on businesses, around facilities, access to facilities, access in schools to uh, safe spaces. Um, and what, what we're really hearing is that people just don't want to, like, they're going to make it, a, the opposition is going to make every one of our hearings into a carnival and the people who run these committees are, they they are our allies and they are our supporters, but they are terrified of that. And they don't like they. There are many many reasons our community, our fellow Democrats are nervous. I mean, I'm just I'm speaking too freely here, so it's on camera. I'll, I'll pay for this later. They don't want to get canceled. They don't want to do wrong by us, and they don't want to get it wrong for the other side to get an opening, and they're nervous about it. 
Um, and to which I say, I understand and don't really care. You know, you want to support the community. This is what the community is asking for. Safer schools. The end, right? We just had this SRO junk that we've been doing, right? And we had our debate on the floor and one of the Republicans said, let's just quit all this hateful rhetoric and make our schools safer. And it's like, fucking, that's what we're talking about. Let's turn down the rhetoric and make the schools safer. But for our issues, we, we just are having a hard time jumping over that that creek right now. And I think, you know, the, the politics of it are actually good for us, but it's hard for me to convince a nervous person from the suburbs that the politics are good for us. I'm a trans person from the city, so of course I'm going to say that. We'd love to have our religious friends come and tell them it's true. Uh, Melissa has a question on Zoom. Hi. Hi. Um... Lee, I don't know if you know, I live in your district. I'm in the University Grove, and I remember meeting you when you were running for office, and I'm so proud. I'm so proud to be one of your constituents. Thank you. I'm also um, a progressive Christian trans woman, and so much of um, the supposed basis for these, these cries for religious freedom, as we all know, I think, in this space, are based on bogus readings of scripture, misreadings, even non-readings of scripture, just claims that the Bible says this or that, or God wants this or that. And there's really very little ground on which to convince people that they're wrong. You know, um, when if I show up in a certain space as a very liberal Christian who's transgender and queer, they're they're going to roll my interpretation out in advance. So I'm just saying I understand a little bit about what you go through in in government halls because people, I remember at the house party where you were, where I met you, someone st stood up and said, well, are you just going to focus on trans things? <laughs> and anyone who looks at your legislative record knows that that isn't so. And yet you're also such an amazing advocate for all of us. And I say all of us mean all humans. Um, I'm someone who has stopped traveling to certain states where it's illegal for me to use a bathroom in, in many buildings. And that's the, that's the flip side of our refuge side, right, is recognizing that we shouldn't sit on our laurels and say, well, we're fine here, we're safe here. We have to work for our own state, but we have to work for other states as well. Anyway, I just, I'm sorry to ramble. I just wanted to greet you and thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. And I do remember meeting you and I do remember that that house party event. And, I, and you know, that was actually a kind of a turning point where I did have to just like, most people, there's data and that shows that most Americans, about 42% of, or I guess the inverse of that, 58% of Americans have never knowingly met a trans person. Um, so when I got into my race, um, part of what I considered that up to be all about was just advocacy work of introducing everyone to a trans person, right? And it was hard for people to understand what it would mean to have me represent them. And it's like, well, we just are people, you know, like school funding is a trans issue, gun violence is a trans issue, food security, like all the things that matter to humans matter to us because we're not monsters, you know, we just live in the community. And it, but it was a really, you know, it was an important thing for people to hear, like everything is a trans issue. And also our communities are being targeted and we have some very specific needs. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I come from probably the corner of the universe where I think there's the least amount that legislation can help. Um, up to last year, I was a private school theology teacher at a Catholic school in Utah. So, um, and it was terrifying. And, you know, the school play being canceled right before opening night because there was a lesbian character. Um, a trans 14 year old getting not allowed to go to church anymore because of complete vacuous grooming allegation that was just general. There wasn't a victim, it was just, oh, you're trans, therefore groomer. 
Um, um, and then school requirements about having to report suicide ideation be given to a drastically anti-trans uh, school therapist, which made things worse rather than better. Um, I mean, I was able to help basically because I made a decision that I was just willing to not follow laws and possibly face the consequence of getting fired, which almost happened several times. But is there anything that can be done to protect students and teachers in private Christian school environments? Obviously, there's not much, but is there anything? That's a great question. Thank you for your service. I mean, I can't imagine how difficult it must be to be in that environment, right? Not just Utah, not just teaching in the in a school, but teaching in a private religious school. Um, no, there's not. Like I, we're, we we are doing everything that we can, and I will I will say in Minnesota. So we just again we just heard um, a bill that wasn't one of our bills. Uh, the Minnesota Human Rights Act brought a bill and, or the Minnesota Human Rights Department has their policy bill and it, last year we had a big, terrible fight over making our Human Rights Act more inclusive. I carried that bill. It was the most vicious experience of my life. My life was turned upside down. Uh, the national right-wing media targeted me, became an absolute nightmare, frankly. Um, but they have a, a new policy bill and it didn't have anything to do with us, but it, oper it offered the Republicans in the community an opportunity to have this conversation about religious exemptions and the Human Rights Act. Um, and when I say no specifically, I mean outside, right? Federally, there really isn't. In the Minnesota Human Rights Act, we are protected and there are, there are certain carved out exceptions for religious practice. Um, and there are certain things that are not carved out for religious practice, right? You can't, for example, you can no longer make a faith-based First Amendment argument that says you will not allow interracial couples, right? That was, I, you know, I don't know how much people know about the history, but that was the big Bob Jones thing, right? In 19, whatever, 80. Um, and we know that, and we have accepted like, Religious freedom does not extend to, we will expel people if they have an interracial relationship. That protection is not prefer not allowed in the Minnesota Human Rights Act. Um, and when we passed the, the new Minnesota Human Rights Act last year, because it gets updated like every 10, 15 years, we did not car, we did not add that exemption. We did not say you are allowed to, as a religious organization, to discriminate based on gender identity. And we'll see if we can hold that this year. Uh, would be great too, because of what, what it meant um, to get that. But we are trying to say that it is not, that's the kind of change that we can make. And what that would do is say, you can't, because it does already include exemptions for sexual orientation. And it now does not include gender identity. So we're in this position because we can't really go, we can eventually, hopefully, make broader the rights of people by saying, what I'm particularly concerned about is expulsions, even more so than hiring of faculty members, right? Under that right, you can expel students, as I'm sure you know, um, from schools and an expulsion is a very serious thing for a student to have on their record. Um, so that's what we're currently fighting in to be able to say the Minnesota Human Rights Act should protect students from being expelled because of who they are. Um, that's extremely controversial. Uh, you will hear about this probably through, if you follow the Capitol, through the rest of the session because that's a, that's a statement I feel comfortable with. And I believe that we can respect religious independence and freedom. And that's where our progressive Christian spaces need to be speaking up. This is not an infringement on our practice of religion to say we should be able to expel a student 
because that student is gay or trans or non-binary. Um, at the end of the day, we are in a position, if we are fighting in a country where the, the institutionalized, oppressive, uh, anti-LGBTQ systems, like we have, they have to be fully and completely dismantled. Uh, you talked about breaking the law, you know? I mean, there are many people in trans communities who are talking about civil disobedience. What does it mean? What does it mean to follow the law if the law says that your humanity should not be respected? Um, you know, and I know it's the most boring, boring thing to hear, but like, if we lose the trifecta, we're done, right? We won't move anything again until the next time we get the trifecta to 12 years, I think, from the last one. Um, now I know that no, nobody's really excited about voting right now, it feels like, but like, if we, if we lose the trifecta, everything that we're doing is stops. Um, and that's all we can do. I wish I had better news, but there's no good news when it comes to the national federal space for, for our community. <laughs> so regarding the, um, going back to the schools bit, um, I know that there's only 13 states in the country that currently have LGBTQ inclusive curriculum laws, like saying that schools have to have that. So where is Minnesota on requiring that? Because I know that we've only got a couple, like a handful of school districts that do it on their own accord throughout front or other means or, you know, welcoming inclusive schools, all those things. But um, given the fact that we are a trans refugee state, <laughs> um, I was really, I'm, I've been really hoping and yearning for that, you know, I know that there'll still be workarounds. And yes, on, in some regards, well, it's just a, rule that says they have to do it but um where are we on that being part of our intrinsic system of understanding of education and that empowerment of students because i really feel like that's going to um not only empower and mentally keep those students safe by hearing their histories and hearing their cultures in the classrooms um but it will also just help the teachers and like the whole environment and culture like symbiotic culture fully grasped like that uh so i was curious where we are yeah it's a great question we don't have that currently we're not one of those states um so but last last year we passed several bills of the ethnic studies requirement uh holocaust studies and the native studies right and we said these are four parts of education people in minnesota every school should learn something about the history the holocaust the, the tribal relations and the native communities and um, our ethnic diversity. Um, all of those bills were controversial, but they all passed. You know, we moved them. Um, we have a, the, a, a similar bill introduced this year, Representative Kozlowski, our, our two-spirit um, trans member from Duluth, uh, has that bill this year. Uh, and it is one of it is one of the bills that we would quote unquote say choose too controversial uh, to move this year, and um, that's bullshit. But uh, you know, there's only so many committee hearings, and I know that that's one that we want to see. We want to have a, a, an inclusive educational system, then we need to recognize the existence and history of queer people and we'll keep fighting for it. It's sort of like when it comes to schools, just so we can like kind of lay this out a little bit, there's like policy wise, there's like the gender inclusion policy, which is like, how are you gonna handle having trans people in your school, All right? What are you gonna do because we're so, wild you need a whole policy about not treating us like shit um and then there's like the facilities right and then there's athletics and then there's curriculum so we also are working on like a new health standards bill right that would be inclusive i mean modernizing health standard education um in, it's terrible in so many ways um but that's something that we're also working on to make sure that we have lgbt inclusive um health standards, but I do want to also just say that we can only do, we can only pass laws. We already know that school districts all over the country and all over Minnesota just disregard them. 
Nobody, nobody's watching the school district's decisions and the execution of local policies. Um, so if they don't follow the law, right? And like to the question over here, the point is like law, it can't solve that problem, right? Like we're just one tool in the culture. But what we can do versus with politics is like here, but then you've got media, then you've got religion, then you've got culture, then you've got, you know, all these other places. And like, we can't, we can just pass laws. We can't make people's hearts um, change. We can't make people want to follow them. That's going to be outside of our purview forever. I know we're coming up on time here. Um... So if there aren't any other questions or comments, oh, one more. Sure, thank you so much. Um, I would say that you are changing hearts and minds every time you show up, you speak your truth. I've heard you many, many times and it's it changes the culture of the room when you come up and speak authentically, just like any of us. When we show up authentically as who we are and speak from our heart on behalf of others, it does change hearts and minds. And so thank you for doing that. I don't have a question. Just you are making that happen, I think, in a lot of ways. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I'm doing what I can, you know, everywhere I can. Well, that's a great place to conclude, I think. So um, please join me in thanking Lee Finke. We're grateful to have you as a friend of United. So grateful for your friendship. Thanks, everyone.